Good morning. Man. I, I, you know, I, I know I've said this before probably several, several times over the last few years, but I just, I thoroughly enjoy um, the worship part of our service. I've been a lot of places, um, and God's blessed me to be a part of a lot of different churches um, in, in worship settings with musicians of varying um, calibers and varying setups from almost on the verge of a television studio to scaled down sitting underneath a tent in a camping um, spot with just a little tiny box drum and a guitar. And one of the things that I've noticed across all of those is the difference in how easy it is um, to slip out of a place where worship is genuine to where it becomes something you do because you're in front of people. Um, and one of the things that I, that I can say about the musicians that we have here um, across the board is I genuinely believe that every single one of them does what they do on this stage, not because they're in front of people, not because they're on a camera, um, on a live stream that's going out across the world, but because they genuinely love God and they genuinely love people, and they genuinely have a, a, a desire to lead people in worship. Um, and it just, it makes it, for me as a pastor, it makes it so much more special to be able to be a part of it um, and, and to just watch everything unfold. Yeah, y'all give them, y'all absolutely give them, give them, it's, it's unbelievable. Like, it really is, and it, it just, it, I don't know. I'm not normally tongue-tied. I'm not normally at a loss for words. For those of you that have been around me, um, I can talk to a brick wall. But it, uh, it, it just means something special because um, this is not the norm in a lot of places. Um, but moving on from that, um, several weeks ago, we started a new series called Faith Checklist. And the idea behind the series is that lists are at the core of everything we do, whether it's an instruction booklet, um, whether it's a how-to book like um, how to internet for, for unintelligent people. Um, I'm not, I'm not going to use the actual word they use, but, um, but the reality is, is that without those lists, without adherence to a list of some kind, um, we can go into a situation, we can go into something, and it inevitably is going to fall apart. We're going to either get stressed out, we're going to get frustrated, or it's just not going to work the way we want it to. And the reality is, is those types of lists don't just limit themselves to our everyday lives. They don't just limit themselves to our workspaces. They don't just in, leave us with our hobbies or anything like that. We actually even have um, checklists and, and lists in general that we apply to our Christian life, whether we realize it or not. Um, in fact, we have one that was so beautifully laid out for us in the book of Galatians um, when Paul was writing to the church in Galatia in chapter 5 um, of the book of Galatians. It says, Now the works of the flesh are evident, sexual immorality, impurity, um, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, and then even into envy and drunkenness and orgies. And, and he says, In these things, things like this, I warn you against. Just like I warned you before. He's done this before. He's warned it twice. He says, those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. And then he gives us another list. It says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. And against those things, there is no law. You know, he gives us this list so that the people in this early church, they could begin to define where they stand. Every list that you've ever been given, whether it's a recipe, a how-to book, or whatever, its sole purpose is to help you know where you stand at all times. Whether you're beginning, whether you're halfway through, whether you're almost done, whatever, it helps you define where you stand in the process. And this list is the same way. It helps us to recognize people that may have the same thought process as we do, the same mindset. And it helps us to measure where we are in our faith. And the thought behind this whole series is, is that if that's the case, then there's other things that are part of that list as well. This is just a little bit. This is just a small picture of it. So what we did was we jumped in to week one, and we started tearing apart and diving into some things that are also part of a checklist that every Jesus follower really should have present in their lives. Some of them are 
are just kind of like, hey, it's not going to ruin your life if it's not there. And some of them are absolute non-negotiables that have to be there if you're going to if you're going to claim to be a Jesus follower. In week one, we dove into it and we talked about worship and we looked at the people of Israel coming out of Egypt and the Exodus and we saw where uh, Moses split the, the Red Sea and they came across and the waters closed in and they immediately worshipped God because of what had happened. We looked at King David who was in the middle of one of the worst times of his life. He had made a mistake. And as a result, God was taking the life of his, of his son. And he prayed and he fasted. And then everything, God kept his promise. His son died. And then he immediately stood up and worshiped God. He cleaned himself up and he worshiped. And then we talked about Paul and Silas who were in prison in the very innermost parts of the jail at, the point, at that point in time where most people would be awaiting a death sentence. If you went to that part of the prison, you were going to die. But while they were there, they worshiped God. And as a result of them worshiping God, he moved, and we walked away from it by saying that our worship shouldn't depend on our happiness. The first thing, one of the things in that checklist for us is our worship. As a Jesus follower, we should be worshiping, and that worship should not depend on our happiness. It shouldn't be dependent on it in any way, shape, or form. When we allow our worship to be dependent on our happiness, we, stint, we tend to stop worshiping because, let's be honest, life is not always happy. We moved on from that, and then we, we took a look at it and said, okay, I want to ask you guys a question. How do you want people to relate to you? How do you want people to remember interactions with you? What do you want them to look back on and say, wow, this is what was true of Tim. This is what was true of David. This is what was true of Raquel and Linda and everybody else that I came in contact with. Jesus spelled it out for us as far as what we should be aiming for. He was sitting with his, with his followers, and he said, listen, the Gentiles, man, they lord their authority over everybody. They put themselves above every single person, but I don't want it to be that way with you. And then he laid it out in Matthew chapter 20. He said, even as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. He said, this is how I want you guys to be remembered. This is how I want people to relate to you and remember you as servants. Service is a must in terms of your relationship with Jesus as far as the evidence of who you are and whose you are. It's not one of those things that will save you. There's nothing you can do, no amount of service you can do that will earn you a place in heaven. But it is a must in the fact that it is proof of the faith that we profess to serve. We serve not because we want people to see Jesus in us, or excuse me, not because we want people to see us, but because we want people to see Jesus in us. And as a result of that, service should be a want to and not a have to. If we will serve people the way that Jesus served, because we want them to see him in everything that we do, then everything about us, people will see Jesus. And that's how they will remember their relating and their relationship with us. And then last week I asked you guys to define what weakness looked like. And we talked about what the world defines weakness as, especially in, in terms of men. You know, it, weakness is defined in the fact that a, a, a real man doesn't cry. If he cries, it's a sign of weakness. If you refuse to take the same stand as everybody else, it means you're weak. If you, don't, if, if you, if you refuse to just not take anything from somebody, it's seen as a sign of weakness. If we, don't forg if we forgive the people who betray us, it's seen as a sign of weakness. And by that very definition, we said that if we went by that, that Jesus Christ was the weakest person that ever walked the face of the earth because every single one of those things he did. He wept at the loss of a friend. He refused to take the same stand that the Pharisees and the Sadducees were taking. He actually taught that if someone strikes you on your right cheek, you turn to them also the other one. And he said, you know what? Father, forgive them because they don't have any idea what they're doing. By that definition alone, he was the, work, the weakest person to ever walk the faith. But as Christians, we said we should be mirroring that because Jesus' compassion reinforced why he came. He was the opposite of who God was understood to be. And his compassion began to tear down the walls and foster relationships between man and God. And we walked away by saying that compassion leads to relationship. When we as Jesus followers, when we as believers, when we begin to exercise compassion in our lives, people see Jesus. And it even got to this point in the book of Philippians, um, Paul's writing to the church of Philippi, and in chapter 2 he says, listen, do everything 
without grumbling or arguing or complaining so that you may become blameless and pure children of God without fault in a warped and crooked generation. And he followed it up like this, because then you will shine among them like stars in the sky. It draws focus to Jesus when we act with compassion to the people around us and in our world. Now, I have another question for you. What, if you had to pick one, what would be your preferred form of communication? If you had to pick one right now, if I went to you and said, okay, what's the best way for me to get in touch with you? How would you prefer me to communicate with you on a daily basis or a weekly basis or a monthly basis? What would it look like? Would it be text message? Would it be instant messenger? Would it be Facebook? Would it be social media of some kind? Would it be email? What would it be? Face to face, what would it look like? All of us, we all have a preferred form of communication. Now, let me ask you this. What is communication? If you had to define it for yourself right now, what would it be? How would you define it? At its very core, communication can be best described as the imparting or exchanging of information or news. That's communication. The imparting or exchanging or receiving of information or news. This is by far the weakest aspect, in my opinion, of humanity right now. Communication. We stink at it. Everybody. We get communication wrong, and here's what I mean. When it comes to information, we are great about giving information. We are great about speaking our mind, telling what we want. We tell everybody but we very rarely stop to listen. We very rarely stop to hear what the other person has to say. We very rarely stop and say, okay, here's my ideas, here's my thoughts, here's what I need for you to hear. Now, reciprocate. We walk away from people. As soon as we tell them what we want to know, they begin speaking, and we miss what's coming next because we're already thinking about what we have to do next. In, in my house, this is a problem for me, if I'm going to be honest. I'm going to be totally transparent. Raquel and I will be having a conversation. I'll tell her something. I'll be like, okay, hey, here's kind of what I'm thinking, and she'll, come, she'll tell me what she's got going on, and I'm already off to the races. I'm already thinking about the next thing that I've got to do that day. I'm already thinking about what I need to, what I'm going to have to tell her next. If there's anything else I've got to tell her, thinking about, okay, well, I need to tell Nevaeh to do this and Sophie to do this. I need, when I get to the office, I need to do this. And she's telling me stuff, and then I'll come back home and she'll say, hey, did you do this? And I'm like, uh, I didn't hear you tell me that. And she'll say, well, I told you right before you left for the, uh, yeah, no. And it, honestly, it drives you crazy. And it drives me crazy because people do it to me. Like I'll be talking to somebody and I'll tell them, hey, I, I need you to think about this for a little bit. And then they'll immediately, oh, yeah, I did that. And I'm like, well, well, no, 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 that's not what I'm telling you. <laughs> we cut people off because we want to make sure that they know, that we know, that they know what we're trying to talk about. Even though we may be go they may be going in a completely different direction. My kids, I love them to death. And they do exactly what they're told to do. They, they really honestly do. Sophie, go clean your room. She's out the door before I can tell her the next thing I need her to do too. <laughs> Nevaeh does the same thing. Nevaeh, hey, I need you to go take Pepper out to the bathroom. And while you're out there, <laughs> okay. They, they are obedient. I mean, they really are. They do. We ask them to do something. They're like, they, we say jump. They say how high, and then they go beyond our expectations. It's, it's, I mean, listen, listen, it is all, it, like, I love my kids. I love the fact that they do what they're asked to do because they are obedient, and they have the heart of a servant. As soon as you ask them to do something, they want so much to serve you that they will do what they're asked to do. But here's, here's the problem, Okay. Communication, like we said, isn't just about giving information. It's also about waiting for the response. It's about taking it beyond just the giving of information. It's about moving beyond that to something else. You know, I asked you earlier, 
you know, if you could sit face to face with God, what would that communication look like? If you could sit and have a face to face conversation, what would it look like? Most of us would say, man, I, I, I would sit and I'd say, God, just tell me everything. Tell me everything. I want to know all of it. I want to know about Adam and Eve. I want to know about what it looked like when you, when you created everything. I want to know what it felt like when you sent Jesus. And then we would say, I would sit and I would listen to him. Now, what if I told you every time you open your mouth to pray, you are in a position to have a face-to-face -face conversation with God? And yet every time we do, we say, God, here's what I need you to know. Amen. Out the door. We misunderstand what the point of prayer is. We misunderstand what it's designed for. Prayer is nothing more than communication with God. And communication, by definition, we said, is also the imparting and receiving of information and news. We tend to treat communicating with God the same way we, tr we treat communicating with people. We start a conversation, we say our peace, and then we walk away. And the reason why is because we don't understand. We really don't. We don't understand the true value and importance behind prayer. Because most of us, I would venture to say, I grew up in church. Okay, I grew up in church from the time I was very, very little, uh, became a believer at a very, very young age. And I never, ever, ever had anybody say to me what I'm going to say to you guys today. And I grew up in the church. So if that's the case, if we don't understand the power behind prayer, then what does the Bible really have to say about prayer? What is it really? Okay. When Jesus was walking the face of the earth, it, when, when he, he had done the, the Sermon on the Mount, he'd been on the Mount of Olives, he had healed people, he had prayed, and his followers had heard him pray, they'd watched him pray, and they realized when he prays, God does something. When he prays, it's like he's got this direct line with God, which of course now we realize and they realized in hindsight, of course he did. He was God in the flesh. But he would pray and things would happen. And he had already said, okay, listen, when you pray, don't pray like the pagans do who think that their many words are going to impress God. Don't pray like the hypocrites do where everybody can see you, but instead go into, into a private place and pray. But even beyond all of those things, his... his, his his followers, his disciples, they said, okay, we want you to teach us how to pray. We want you to teach us what this looks like because the way you do it and the way we do it are completely different. When you speak, God listens. When we speak, it goes three inches above our head and just disappears. So what is so different? about the way you pray. And if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to the book of Matthew chapter 6, okay? If you don't have your Bibles, you can jump out to the YouVersion app on your, um, on your phone, and you can follow along right there in the events section. You'll see it there. Um, but Jesus is teaching, and he goes in, he's like, okay, you guys want me to teach you what this looks like, Matthew chapter 6. You want to know what this looks like, I'm going to teach you, and I'm going to teach you something that is so revolutionary that you've never heard it put this way before. Now, one thing that I learned, and this is so crazy to me, I never really thought about it. When the temple was destroyed by Rome um, in Jerusalem, sacrificial um, worship, sacrificial offerings completely went away. They had nowhere they could do it. And so what the religious leaders did, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and, and the Zealots, and all the other religious leaders, they, they stepped back and they said, okay, since we can't do this now, we can't do temple worship because the temple's been torn down, we're going to shift our sacrificial worship to prayer. Prayer went from being just a, com a conversation with God and it became a sacrificial act of worship. And even to this day, Orthodox Jews will still pray three times a day. A lot of the rabbis that live in Jerusalem will still go to the Wailing Wall, which is the only still visible wall of the original temple in Jerusalem. They will still stand there, and they have a booklet or a pamphlet, and they will pray there at that wall at least three times a day. They sacrifice of themselves to pray as an act of worship. 
Why is this so important? Why, why do I bring it up? Well, it's because of this. Matthew chapter 6, starting in verse 9, we see where Jesus teaches his followers to pray. He says, okay, you want to pray? Pray then like this. And he recites a prayer that we've heard our entire lives. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. He teaches them, this is how I want you to pray. This is how you should pray. This is what your prayer should look like. We've taken it and we've run with it and we've made it an actual prayer that we pray, which isn't necessarily wrong. There's nothing wrong with it. It's not going to hinder your relationship with God. But it was never intended to be an actual prayer that we prayed. It was something that he taught to say, here's how you should pray when you pray. Okay? So Jesus takes this and he puts it into practice. And this, he's saying, this is how I pray. This is, this is kind of the model for what I do. And then in John chapter 11, we see a, new, we see a different side of prayer from Jesus. Jesus, he, he's been with his followers. And some, he gets a message saying, listen, your friend Lazarus is sick. And everybody gets up to leave, and he's like, no, 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 go ahead and sit down. We're not going anywhere yet. Um, but he's sick. I, I know. I understand. But we're not leaving yet. They wait a little while, then they leave. While they're on their way, Lazarus dies. He gets to Bethany, and everyone runs out to him, and they're like, he's gone. And Jesus just shakes his head and he says, no, he, he's just asleep. It's, it's okay. It's going to be okay. And Lazarus' sister comes out and just berates Jesus and says, if you had been here, he would have lived. And he's like, oh, my goodness, you people don't get it. He says, I've told you over and over again, anyone who believes in me will never die because I am the resurrection. And he looks around, and the Bible says in this moment, he looks around and he sees the, 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 the unbelief of the people around him. He sees what's going on. And the shortest verse in all of the Bible unfolds two words, Jesus wept. He didn't weep over the loss of his friend. He didn't weep over his, home, over his own heartbrokenness. He wept over their disbelief and the unbelief of the people who knew him. And so Jesus steps up in verse 42, and he says this prayer. He says, I knew that you always hear me. I know that you hear me every time I pray. But I'm saying this on account of the people standing around, that they may believe that you sent me. He prays, and he prays to God. He says, okay, I know you're going to hear what, what I'm going to say. I know what you're going to do. You know what you're going to do, but I'm saying this for their sake. And then he lays in and he does what we all have heard our entire lives of this story. He says, roll the stone away. They roll the stone away after saying, well, we could roll it away, but he's been in there three days. It's going to stink. He says, I don't care. Roll the stone away. They roll it away. And it says, he cries out, Lazarus, come forth. And Lazarus comes out of the tomb, still bound in his grave clothes. Now, what Jesus does in these two passages is completely rewrite everything that humanity has ever understood about prayer. We like to go to these places and say, Jesus said, if I pray anything according to his name, it'll be done. If any two people pray according to my will, it'll be done. Yes, but there's something missing. There's a flaw in that logic. And I know, I know, people are going to go back and look at this and go, well, he's a heretic. He's, he's speaking blasphemy because he's saying that the scriptures are flawed. No, 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 I'm not saying the scriptures are flawed. I'm saying our understanding of those scriptures is flawed. Our understanding of the heart of those scriptures is flawed. Because yes, if we pray anything according to Jesus' name, as a representative of him and what his desires are, it will be done. And I can prove it. We're going to jump back to the Lord's Prayer for a second, okay? So if you've got your Bible and you want to go back and you want to follow along, super, super easy, just jump back to Matthew chapter 6. We're going to hit there again, okay? So Jesus goes in and he, he starts to under, unwrap what our prayer should look like. 
Okay, so he says, okay, you want to learn how to pray? Then pray like this. Okay, we're going to walk through this. Pray then like this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. This word, hallowed, go back for me. This word right there, hallowed be your name. This is an understanding and a pushing of who God is. This is an acknowledgement of who he is. That word hallowed is a big fancy way of saying holy and powerful and mighty. It's an understanding of saying, God, you are big. Your name is bigger than my name ever will be. Jesus says, when you pray, you have to understand who you're talking to. You have to understand what's really going on. You're communicating. It's not just communicating Andrew and John talking to each other. No, this is you and the creator of the universe. This is you and the one who breathed life into you. So when you sit down to pray, understand that this is not just some random person understand who you're talking to. They don't exist for you. And he goes on, he says, holy is your name. Now your kingdom come, your will be done. Jesus steps back. He says, now that you've understood who he is, now that you realize how big he is and you've acknowledged it, then you've got to understand it's not about what you want. It's about what he wants. It's about understanding that his will needs to be done here on earth. In heaven, he speaks, and it's done. We see it in the book of Genesis. Said, he said, let there be light, and boom, there was light. When we acknowledge who Jesus is, who, who the Father is, who God is, who Jesus is, and we say, oh, my goodness, I want everything about who you are because you are bigger than I am. I want you here. I want when you speak for it to happen here on earth just like it does in heaven. I want so much what you want that I'm going to put myself on the back burner. And then he goes on, he says, so give us this day our daily bread. He says, don't care. It's not about what I want, God. You know what I need. And so I want you to take me out of the equation because I've already, I've already set you ahead of me and higher than me by acknowledging how big you are. And so I want you to take me out of the equation, and I want your will to be done here on earth by providing for me my daily bread. Just like you did for Israel in the desert. And then he takes it a step further. Give us this day our daily bread and, and forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. Now, this tends to trip us up a little bit. Because we say, oh, God, God is faithful and just to forgive us. Well, in this prayer, <laughs> he says, okay, God, forgive us. But don't just forgive us. Forgive us the same way that we forgive the people who have wronged us. Mm. That's uncomfortable. Jesus had already even earlier spoken and said, if you're there at the altar in the temple and you're going to bring an offering of worship and you remember that your brother has something against you, leave it there. And then go and make it right, or at least attempt to make it right, and then come back and your Father in heaven will accept your worship. He says, God, give us what we need for this day. Provide my needs. That's not something de dependent on how we treat other people. That's something that is completely dependent on the Father. He provides us our daily needs. And he says, okay, God, now I want you to do something for me that is completely dependent on me. Forgive me of my sins in the same manner that I forgive the people who have sinned against me. Ouch. Kind of shifts the way we think about prayer, doesn't it? Jesus didn't ask for anything. He didn't tell God what God was going to do. He said, God, you're bigger than I am. You know what I need, so please provide it for me. Oh, and while we're at it, since you and I have this kind of relationship, please look into my heart and take a look at the people around me and look for unforgiveness in my heart. 
so that I can then forgive them so that you can forgive me. Okay, I get it. What am I supposed to learn from that? Well, let's jump back into John chapter 11, verse 42. He says, I knew you would always hear me, but I said this on account of the people standing around. Why? So that they may believe. Not because of me, not because I want people to look at me, but so that they would believe. Jesus knew what was about to happen. God knew what was going to happen. But it had nothing to do. Jesus even said, I don't want this to be about me. I just want them to, to believe that you, that you, the Father in heaven, are the one that made all of this possible. See, we pray wrong. For us, prayer isn't, it, it's, for us in a lot of ways, it's, it's a, it, it, it's a, it's a, it's kind of like a one-way request line. It's like calling into your favorite radio station and saying, hey, I pay your bills, so you got to do what I want you to do and play this song for me. We tend to put ourselves first. Jesus says, God, you are huge. We pray for what we want. Jesus said, no, 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 pray, I want your will here. We pray, give me what I want. Jesus says, give me what I need. We pray, forgive me, forgive me, forgive me. Jesus says, okay, first, forgive me after I forgive them and make it okay. A lot of times, Jesus' followers pray to make ourselves look good. Jesus says, God, I just want you to show up and show out so people will see you. In the church, prayer has become about making sure that we get what we want. And when I say in the church, I'm talking about the worldwide ecclesia that we talked about back in January. I can't tell you the number of times that I have seen articles that have come out and even talked to other Jesus followers who have said, man, I'm, just, I'm praying for this. And it's all selfish things. It's nothing that's going to push Jesus closer to people or push people closer to Jesus, I mean. It's things like, I want a new car. I want a new house. I want this. I want this. It's never, 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 never. Jesus, I want you to impact their life. I, I, I need for you to show up in their world so they can see who you are. See, for us, prayer, it has to be more than just communicating with God. It has to be more than just a request line. Why? Because when Jesus prayed, Jesus turned prayer into something that exists to free God up to be God. Well, now, wait a minute. God is God. Yeah, I know. God can do anything. Yes, he can. But how many times do we get in the way because we don't ask God to be God in a situation? We pray, God, I need to hear from you. I want to know more. I want to grow. Okay, bye. And then we walk away. I'm not saying God can't work in that. But what I'm saying is, is when a believer prays, it should be about freeing God up in our lives and giving him full access to be who he wants to be in our lives. Why do you think people don't ask? Why do you think people don't ask people to pray for them anymore? Because they know they're not going to do it. And if they do, it's going to be, well, come here and let me pray with you real quick. And it's, when prayer becomes more about people seeing you than seeing God, then you fall and you wound the reputation of Jesus in your life. The evidence of prayer in a Jesus follower should be God 
you know my needs. I take care of them because I know you are so much bigger than I could ever dream. And while you're at it, they're having a really hard time. Can you show up for them? Because I know that you want them to see you for who you are. When was the last time that you prayed that way? When was the last time that you sincerely, genuinely prayed that way? That God, I know you are huge. You are monstrously big and I am so small. And I need for you to be you and take me out of the way. Again, prayer isn't one of those things that will completely wreck your relationship with God to the point where you can't go to heaven. But it is one of those things that when we pray the right way, the way that Jesus taught us, it puts him first and foremost and front and center in every avenue of our life so that people see him for who he is. The ancient Jews had a word, a name really, that they used for God. And it was Yahweh. Yahweh was the name that they used when they were talking about the big and almighty and powerful God. And it's at his name, not ours, that mountains tremble. It's at his name, not our name, that the dead are raised. It's at his name, not our name, that sicknesses are healed. It's not in our name, but it's at his name that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that he is Lord. When we make prayer about God, it frees God up to do and be who he needs to be in the lives of the people we come in contact with. What we do with that from this point forward is up to us. What will you do? Will it continue to be just a God, give me, give me, give me, and then walking away without taking time to stop and listen to the Father? Or will it be God, I want you to show up and show out so that people can see you. Father, thank you for loving us. Thank you for pushing us and challenging us to be more than really we dare to be. I pray, at least in my life, that I would have the courage to when I pray, to take myself out of the equation and to shift my focus onto you and to strive to hear you more clearly. And Father, for all of us in this room, I pray that we would shift our prayers and start freeing you up to be who you want to be in our world and in our own personal lives. God, you are so much more than we give you credit for. In Jesus' holy name, amen.